This is Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman. And you're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam, streaming at DCAUreview.com and on your favorite podcast app. Gotham City is out of control. An entire city screaming in fear. Super villains walk the streets, prey on the innocent. They will learn the true nature of power. The police are powerless. A creature prowls this urban wasteland. Is that? He moves in darkness. For some, he is a rumor. A name whispered in the corridors of the underworld. Waiting for the chance to strike. Let every criminal know the acid taste of fear. You crazy! Go back! Fight back! But Gotham has forgotten what justice means. The Dark Knight is here to remind them. Batman. Good guys wear black. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 178 of the DCAU Review. I am one of your two hosts, Cal, and with me, my good friend, good brother, the man that runs our Twitter account. It's Liam. Liam, welcome to the month of Rocktober. I'm sorry, October. And we are here discussing a brand new series wrapped up with our Elseworlds Villains Month from last week. And now we are moving forward here, turning the calendar page and returning to our roots where it all began. That's right. We have uh, we are back in the time of Batman the Animated Series. You always bust my chops because I say the world, but it's all <laughs> technically the same world. So the time of Batman the Animated Series, and we are picking up where we left off in the production order in which we review these episodes. And uh, yeah, we have an interesting one to talk about today with uh, some parallels to the second Tim Burton film and other things. And uh, this one features the Penguin and uh, a lot of focus on uh, vehicular sabotage. So we got a lot to talk about with today's episode, The Mechanic. That is right, Liam. And this one I remember growing up. Uh, this is one we may have had this one on videotape because I feel like we saw this one a, a fairly good deal. Uh, I don't know if this was on. I don't think this was on any, one of the. Is this on the Penguin the Warner Brothers videotape, maybe? Or did, I believe it is, but I think we didn't get that until later on. So this might have been one we actually properly uh, taped off of uh, Fox Fox Kids back in the day. But okay. Yeah, we definitely have this one uh, somewhere in our rotation. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because I I remembered a lot of the beats, a lot of the uh, the lines from the episode before I even rewatched it this evening, not having seen it for a very long time. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it's definitely one that is memorable for several reasons, and uh, we'll get into talking about that this evening uh, or this morning when you're listening to this <laughs> live. Always, <laughs> whenever you press press the play button. Uh, so let's get into discussing that uh, the. Main Mechanic, as you mentioned, uh, originally aired. Now, here's something interesting. I always look up the air date beforehand, and generally speaking, just go off of whatever the DCAU wiki uh, lists as the original air date for the episode. But uh, Liam, we looked up the original air date for this, and it was odd because you you pointed out that the original air date, uh, both on the DCAU wiki, the Batman, the animated series wiki, and even the IMDb page, all say January 24th, 1993, which would have been a Sunday. And this is mm -hmm. 1993, not 1992. So several months after they started airing Batman, the animated series in prime time on Sunday evenings on Fox. So not sure if it went that long after the original originally started airing them back in, in September, if it lasted four months that long that they were airing these, or if that's potentially an incorrect date i did see listed at least one other place that this may have debuted on saturday uh, the 23rd of january 1993 either way uh, we just passed the 28 year anniversary of this episode uh not too long ago so looking forward to uh to covering that episode today but before we do 
I'm sure, uh, as you always do, you have the Internet Movie Database official synopsis. Still waiting for an official sponsor here for this segment, but uh, the official Internet Movie Database synopsis for this week's episode. That is right. And this is for the episode The Mechanic, which is written by Steve Perry, not that one, Laren Bright and Randy Rogel, and directed by Kevin Altieri. Friend of the show. That's right. (laughs) Music by John... Tatchenhorse and Peter Tomaszek and animation by Dong Yang. And that synopsis reads as such. The penguin finds the mechanic who designs Batman's Batmobiles and forces him to turn the current model into a death trap. All right. I like that one, actually. I like that it ends on death trap. Yes. Yes. I uh, put a little extra info on that one. I like that ending as well. Um, yeah, that is uh, a, a pretty decent synopsis of this one. It's it's very linear. It's very like there's not really a, a B plot to this episode at all. It's just uh, you know we open with the Batmobile chasing down uh, the what appears to be the Penguin's limousine. Although how embarrassing is this? Uh, you know the Batmobile is chasing it and ends up getting uh, wrecked. And the bad guys get away. Penguin's not even in there. They just got they just got punked out by like three guys. <laughs> they were driving the penguin's car. Um, but uh, that leads us to uh, finding out a little bit about uh, it's, it. It helps to answer the the question, at least in part, of uh, where does he get those wonderful toys? As we see, Batman and Robin take the very very damaged Batmobile to a man named Earl Cooper, who is the uh, aforementioned mechanic what happened you've been letting the kid drive again ha ha actually we were playing chicken with a penguin looks like the penguin won the penguin or three of his men at least but they flew the coop then i guess you'll be needing the loners again Diamond, the whole suspension, all shot the heck. I'll call you in a couple of days. Better make it a week. Looks like we're gonna have to order a whole new drivetrain. Come on, Robin. Yeah, that's right. Uh, If you were ever wondering uh, who Batman's mechanic was, this is the episode for you. That's what you're trying to (laughs) say. Uh, yeah, so as uh, as we learn, Batman brings in this well damaged Batmobile to uh, to Earl and strikes up a conversation with Earl and his daughter. Do they ever name his daughter? What's his daughter's name? Uh, I believe it's referred to as Marva in okay. the uh, in the credits. I'm sure they mentioned it once. I think I, Robin. You know, Robin name. called. Robin, I think, asks where she is at one point. Mm-hmm. So, so that that makes sense um or or maybe bruce does and or batman does and that robin time. definitely does yeah yeah all right so uh, marva and earl who are uh, in charge of of uh, rehabbing the batmobile that is as you mentioned is completely destroyed and i guess we also learn where uh, batman gets those wonderful bat cycles as well as Earl happens to have a pair of bat cycles ready to go for Robin and Batman to use. We get multiple forms of transportation used in this episode. The only thing missing, I think was the bat plane. Uh, I guess bat boat too. Didn't, didn't quite make an appearance here, but uh, are we going to head cannon that Earl is responsible for all of the vehicles or just the, just the automobiles here? I would say the, the ones with wheels, uh, I would say, but the plane has wheels too to land. Does that count? Look, don't be that guy. All right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> tweet tweet your thoughts you to know Liam. what i meant <laughs> tweet your thoughts to liam on who's responsible for building <laughs> that plane at dcau review on that is a good question though because yeah, yeah he, he, clearly he's uh, at least partially responsible for the motorcycles as well as the uh the batmobile itself we find out a little bit later in the episode he not only built it but designed it himself um so he's a uh, quite a capable guy but yeah we're not sure if he's also responsible for the uh the bat flying saucer uh, that they call the bat plane, 
or the question uh, about the designs too we'll get to that in a second i mean we'll we'll talk about the actual you know visuals later on and stuff like that but if you recall there is there is the idea that uh, from batman mask of the phantasm that bruce was inspired by the look uh up for the batmobile from the world's fair like the 19 whatever it was whatever era this was that world's fair that he goes to with andrea and there's a car there that he's staring at and it happens to have a lot of similar design and visuals that eventually would become the Batmobile. So do you think do you think he gave like, oh, all right, I want the big fins on the car like this one that I saw at the World's Fair <laughs> way back in the day, Earl? Or did Earl just happen to be like he's like, yeah, everybody loved that World's Fair car. So I'm going to just assume that Batman liked it, too. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't, uh, I don't know what uh, which is which, which there, because that is a little bit of a an inconsistency, I would say, in in the, in that, because we do clearly see Earl drawing up the uh, the diagram for this Batmobile. So yeah, maybe it's maybe they collaborated to an uh, to an extent, and uh, Earl, I guess, how would how would in bat in this nineteen uh, thirties future world of Batman the animated series would. We send we send Batman a telegram <laughs> with, the, with the design. Yeah, 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 definitely. No, no email existed. That's send him some microfilm. Yeah. Oh, now yeah. we're talking here. All right, back check, check. back to the plot. We're getting off. We're getting off here. I'm sorry, I derailed us, but no. yeah. So so uh, Earl sends them out on a pair of motorcycles as he begins to begins to uh, decide what it's going to take to fix the Batmobile and starts putting in some orders for these custom parts. Uh, we then cut back to the penguin who is rather upset at his henchmen for bringing him uh, less than desired wares from their or spoils from their their robbery. He apparently had sent them out to get certain uh, stamps, uh, Autobahn stamps or something like that, and they got the wrong one. So he's seen quite throwing a tantrum. And in order to sort of quell him, one of his henchmen, who, by the way, happened to be named Falcone or Falcone, depending on uh, your preferred pronunciation. Very interesting and uh, familiar last name there. If uh, if you're familiar at all with either uh, the Christopher Nolan Batman films, perhaps, or any sort of Batman lore, the name Falcone is certainly a very important last name, but sort of a passing reference here. Yeah, I thought that was interesting because I think this henchman appears in one other episode. Um, and it's, it is interesting just because there were there obviously are mobster characters that sort of fit the role from the the Batman year one and, and long Halloween comics, as well as the movies and such uh, like the, the Falcone role. But that's mostly filled by like, uh, you know, Rupert Thorne. And we we have like Stromwell and, and to- Tony Zuko and some of these other like small time gangsters. Uh, Vinny the Shark, some of these guys, but they don't really, they kind of stayed away for the most part from naming those uh, specific sort of Frank Miller era Batman uh, mob mob guys. So it was kind of a, a, I thought a nice cheeky reference to throw in here. Plus it doubly works because it's also a bird pun. Exactly. Yes. I, I heard it at first and I was like, did he just call him Falcon or Falcone? But yes, the uh, certainly the, the credits revealed that his last name was indeed Falcone or Falcone. So we uh, we continue here. And as uh, as as Falcone attempts to quell the penguins anger just a bit, he uh, introduces them to what do you know? He just happened to run into an old acquaintance of his that works for an automobile sales company and discovered and stumbled upon some interesting custom orders that had recently come through his company, which he details to the Penguin. And putting two and two together, the Penguin is quick to understand that uh, these are just not for any sort of ordinary vehicle. No, no. These special custom parts are for the Batmobile. Titanium steel wheel welds, 12-gauge piston pins. Very few vehicles use such unusual material as those. And the point of this is what? I think these parts were ordered for the Batmobile. Hmm? Tell him why, Arnie. Well, right after I got that order, Falcone told me about what happened to the Batmobile while he was chasing your limo the other day. 
from the description, I'd say the kind of damage the Batmobile would have sustained might require the kind of replacement parts in that order. Yes, yes, I understand. You do? Why, yes, and it's absolutely brilliant. A first-rate piece of detective work. You ought to be rewarded, sir. And uh, he's all but too happy to accept the information that uh, the salesman is happy to provide. And he also is willing to repay him in a way <laughs> for his uh, for his uh, for his contribution to the penguin right there and there. That's right. So this is, uh, and we'll certainly talk more about this in visuals, as you said, Cal. This is one of our first sort of uh, Batman Returns homages or or uh, references in the episode as we get the giant inflatable rubber ducky, which I think did he did he also use that in um, Birds of a Feather? Did he send Veronica's friend on? Oh yes, he did. There was a duck boat in that for yes. sure. So, this is the second appearance of the duck boat. He sends. This, uh, yeah, this sort of slimy, wormy guy uh, down to his doom. But first, he does write him a check, which brings up a point that you and I have discussed long ago on this show uh, and actually was just brought up to us again this week on, uh, on Twitter, funny enough. But uh, there was previously an episode where Two-Face had a credit card in the name and it, the name on the card said Two-Face. Uh-huh. And that caused us to theorize about like what bank is giving this guy a credit card. Uh-huh. And if there's like a secret supervillain, uh, you know, credit union out there somewhere. Right. And I have to wonder, like, what checks is is the penguin writing? Like, oh, what bank is the penguin? Yeah. Well, yeah. What bank is the penguin? Does he have because either they're fake checks that he walks around just in case he's going to do this bit where he writes a guy a fake check. Which I mean, I appreciate the commitment to the bit, but that's kind of weird. But then it also, if it, but it also creates an alternate scenario where he has a bank account somewhere, and that fascinates me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing that you could you could sort of uh, explain it away as is you know being a cobble pot. You know, if you take the more modern, I think that Gotham or that Batman Telltale game where he was sort of in equal to the cobble pots or actually also in the Gotham television series, it was similar. The cobble pots were these rich, uh, it, this rich family that was rivaled the Waynes. So you have maybe, maybe he's just writing stuff off of the cobble pot estate account. Maybe I, I don't know, but regardless, we know that he, that he had no intention of letting that man cash that check regardless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I just raises more questions than it answers is all <laughs> but uh yeah that uh from there we we get uh, the penguin and his goons sort of descending on Earl and Marva in the uh in the warehouse where they're holed up uh, working on the Batmobile and we uh at that point the penguin is in the, in the addition to wanting to sabotage the Batmobile his curiosity kind of gets the better of him and he, he just has to know why Earl is so loyal to Batman and how he got this job as Batman's mechanic in the first place we get a flashback where Earl was working as a as a I guess a, des a vehicle designer uh, for a uh, generic uh, large automobile firm and uh, notices a flaw in in their brake system but uh the, uh, the boss tells them not to worry about it because their legal department has assured them that even if the brakes do fail on these cars, we can't be held liable for it. Then if our Mr. Cooper is going to become a liability, I suggest we take steps to minimize our risk, hmm? That same night, they sick some hired muscle on me. <laughs> sure that day but long after the global scandal was forgotten I still had a reputation as a whistleblower 20 years in the business and I couldn't get work as a wrench jockey I was down to my last dime no money no job 
and no prospects for one. And wouldn't I mean what talk about unrealistic, right? Like a a major car manufacturer cutting corners resulting in potential deaths. I mean, that would never happen, but never, uh, never happen. Uh, Rich corporate greed never yeah. would happen. This is a little right. too unbelievable here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so they, and uh, when Earl uh, doesn't go along with the plan, there's some hired muscles sicked on him to try to keep him quiet. And thankfully Batman happened to have been listening in on this, uh, this meeting where they, where they talked about calling in some muscle to take care of Earl and he saves Earl's life, but Earl, he mentions this. And again, another super unrealistic thing, which is because he did the right thing and called him, you know, and blew the whistle, uh, no company wanted to hire him. And so he, he was destitute and down to his last dime when uh, Batman and a rickety old Batmobile drives up and, informs him that he needs a new car and uh as as we've already talked about uh we find out that earl uh designed this batmobile perhaps with some help from batman but uh and he and uh and his daughter built it for him and they've been sort of the loyal mechanics taking care of uh, all of batman's at least his land vehicular needs uh for uh for from then on um and uh, so that leads to the penguin setting up Earl and, and demanding that he give him control over Batman's uh, over the Batmobile. And we have a nice little remote control that he can use to control it as uh, as Batman and Robin return to pick up the seemingly completed Batmobile. And uh, we're almost quite literally off to the races from there for our grand finale. Yeah, uh, Earl does his very best, and and uh, we must mention that Penguin also uh, absconds with uh, Marva as well, keeping her hostage as a, an insurance policy. So Earl is not there to be able to give Batman a tip off that uh, the Batmobile is sabotaged. Uh, he does his best through some coded language to tell Batman, but Bat and Batman sort of picks up that there's something amiss, but doesn't quite. Uh, get it right then and there until later on they're driving away and he and Robin sort of have this conversation where he mentions that he felt like something was off and uh, at that point the penguin pulls up alongside of him and sort of does a drag race type maneuver and cuts Batman off uh, for some reason his uh, his his car has the ability to pass flatulence I guess because it literally does that in front of him <laughs> and uh, with, complete with sound I didn't quite get that I don't know why they wrote that into the into the episode but okay and then the car takes off and as Batman begins the pursuit he quickly realizes that he is not in control and uh, as the penguin has activated the device that allows him to remotely control the Batmobile again fans of Batman Batman Returns may uh, may find this plot point a bit familiar as well as uh, Batman in Batman Returns ha has a similar issue with the Penguin taking over the Batmobile and driving it himself. Well, although we don't get any Danny DeVito sitting in a uh, sitting in a, a tiny Batmobile <laughs> uh, child seat in this one here, so uh, mine half a star off for that, I think for uh, for not, for no Danny DeVito. But uh, we do get the the race continues, and as they pull off into the into the uh, Gotham airport at this point, uh, the Penguin takes over the Batmobile, drives Batman and it's sort of in and around the airport up on top of a parking garage and decides he's going to launch the Batmobile off and Batman to his doom. And despite attempts to try and escape the Batmobile, Batman and Robin cannot do so. However, at the very last second, Batman recalls that Earl, uh, in his coded language, mentioned that he had fixed the air conditioning switch. And by doing so, Batman figured out that that was his secret way to hit that in case they needed to eject. I've got a feeling we're about to take the hard way down. Down? The basement. Huh? Earl, he kept saying basement. It's a racing term. When drivers crash, they say they've gone down in the basement. He was trying to warn us. The air conditioning switch. He said he fixed it. Pity. 
It was a magnificent vehicle. <laughs> yeah. They do just in time and gliders come out. Hey, do you think so? Here we go. If if you're if you're saying that he Earl didn't have anything to do with the bat plane, he at least has some sort of like aviation experience or expertise because he created those gliders that fly out of the back of the the ejector seats man well, there you go uh, I, I think i think we have uh, exhibit a for why i think that earl at least had some play here in the in the uh the, the bat wing okay creation. so uh I, they uh continue in in pursuit of the penguin at that point much to his uh his surprise and uh they they lead a, a small chase through the airport continuing on until uh, as batman is attached to the back of the of the limousine by uh, bat grapple and they try and sort of lose batman by taking him under a plane but in the process they chop the top of their own limousine off uh, underneath a, of a tractor trailer and uh at that point the penguin drops out and uh takes marva hostage and uh is shooting at batman with his uh, umbrella gun and coming from behind comes robin swinging in on the bat glider to uh to foil the bird just in time for us uh, to to get another shot of the penguin slamming his fists on the ground very similarly <laughs> several times. Uh, seems to be his signature way to be upset after he's foiled at the end of an episode. So uh, he's none too happy. And then we get the uh, sort of comedic ending uh, before we see that uh, that Batman is back with Earl promising him a new location for a garage now that the penguin knows where he is so it's gonna get him a new, better new one a better uh, place and slips in by the way that uh, his backers are the ones that are helping him set up a new place uh, kind of giving giving us the clue that Earl is not none the wiser that uh, Batman and Bruce Wayne perhaps are the same person unlike maybe what we've seen in the Nolan films where you have lucius fox being well aware of who batman is mm -hmm. uh, so uh and then we get a, a sort of a comedic ending to the episode as we flash to the uh, stonegate penitentiary is penguin is there working on i guess what is a very archaic idea now but the uh the criminals were required to work on the license plate manufacturing uh, for this <laughs> state of gotham question mark uh as we see and, and uh he picks up a license plate that says one bat for you and is none too happy as we sort of uh, fade out on the end of the episode there and that's uh that's kind of where we're done liam so uh several plot elements here borrowed from batman returns uh so some familiar things that would be familiar for those that were tuning in uh, and, and appreciating this uh, this series if you were an adult and had seen Batman Returns uh, pretty recently. But um, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it's an episode, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, like there's little things I like about it. I like the idea of this guy who did the right thing and was sort of in trouble and then, you know, destitute as a result of doing the right thing. And Batman not only saved him from, you know, being killed or beaten or whatever but also then you know kept it kept tabs on him enough to know okay he needs a job i need a car i can help this guy in another way so i'm always a fan of any superhero uh kind of going the extra mile for people it's you know not just being you know not just being the fireman who comes out and puts out sort of the obvious uh the obvious danger and that you know and fa found a way to help this guy beyond what uh uh, just uh, p beyond what punching can do for someone. So I, I, I like that element, but yeah, as it is, it's just like, well, it's, it's just very straightforward. Uh, you know, there's, I, yeah, I guess there are some elements here that would are sort of retroactively similar to uh, the dark Knight, um, in that there's a plot point in that movie of a sort of a low level employee in Wayne Enterprise just looking around at like the budget and what parts are being ordered in, in the company and going, huh, could build some Batmobiles with that. <laughs> and and then trying to uh use that to, to get himself rich. So yeah, I think there's um there's some there's some interesting stuff here that would be uh that would be used or had been used by other uh creators as well. So yeah, I, I don't think it's bad by any means, but the episode itself it's just it's just so kind of just there. Like it's, there's nothing wrong with it, but 
Uh, I kind of had trouble uh, settling on a score for this one because I don't dislike it at all, but I don't think it does a lot to surprise you or there's not really like a great character moment for anybody other than, like I said, maybe that that stuff with Batman, uh, you know, finding a job for this guy. But uh, yeah, so this one was a little bit hard for me to uh, to finalize a score on, but uh, I went ahead and settled on a six out of ten. Nice. I went just a tick higher. I think the things that uh, with a seven out of 10, um, I I think the things that uh, are fun in this, as you said, the flashback scene with with Batman showing a little bit of Batman's character, his heart, his compassion uh, for those that are less fortunate, rewarding good, because we see that the reason why Batman saved Earl from the, the heavies that were sent after him from this car company where the Batman was doing some sort of reconnaissance on this on this uh, automobile company anyway. So Batman maybe sort of stumbling upon the fact that there was one good person in this company or a good person in this company that was looking, you know, that they were looking to punish uh, for his goodness or his innate goodness and Batman rewarding that. And then not forgetting about it and, and and remembering him at a time when he was in need that, and really setting him up. So, you know, it reveals something about Batman's character. You know, we love seeing you know we've talked about it way back with uh, the forgotten where batman you know bruce wayne is this billionaire but it's it's difficult for him to be able to officially solve all of these big problems um with just you know with his his money can do some but he kind of runs into a brick wall at some point when it comes to the crime so the fact that he's able to kind of help this one individual um, is a is a way I think that reveals Batman's character and has a heart, even though his his life's passion or is set up defending the city from the crime. Um, that he uses his other his other resources to help citizens um, that he deems you know worthy of that. So it's it's kind of cool. Um, Mm -hmm. the rest of the episode, it is kind of fun to see the penguin driving around the Batmobile and driving it on top of the, on top of the parking garage and launching it off. And, uh, there's several, you know, several funny lines in here, you know, some, some great dialogue when he tells, when he tells, uh, when he tells Earl to bid his best customer adieu. I thought that was great. Uh, you know, just pure evil dripping off of him at that point. And, um, you know, as far as uh, there's not really a plot other than he's going to sabotage the Batmobile. There's not really, oh, he just, he doesn't like Batman. So we're going to sabotage the Batmobile and get rid of him. Um, there's the, the weird thing with the car. Sa- like I get why they had the car sales or the auto part salesman come in, but the fact that he just right. murders, murders the auto salesman. Like I thought that was, that's something you don't see in most like, there's no stay alive grown. He's basically flushed down. <laughs> he's flushed down this <laughs> tube on a, on a giant rubber ducky. We have to assume that he's, he gone. <laughs> you are to be rewarded, sir. <gasps> Reward? Would $300,000 be enough? 300000 Oh, all right. 400000 but that's my final offer. Don't spend it all in one place. Excuse me. I don't get it, boss. It's all right here. Our friend Mr. Rundle amassed newspaper reports of various instances when the Batmobile was damaged. Then he checked the dates against the other times his company got orders for these types of materials. <clears throat> In every case, it was a match. The same exact date. Uh, excuse me. Where will this take me? On a sea cruise. Here, look at these bills of lading. All the orders come from the same repair shop run by a certain Mr. Cooper. (laughs) So there is some, uh, you know, uh, some very evil moments from this villain uh, that uh, otherwise is just sort of the butt of a joke sometimes. So uh, I, I 
did appreciate that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's probably not one uh, that I would recommend if you're, if you're looking for a, a full 22 entertaining minutes. Uh, it's, it's really the last third of it is really where you get most of the action, I feel like, and the rest of it is just sort of building to that, which is okay. It doesn't have to be all action packed every single episode, I suppose. Yeah, it's yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. Like I said, it's not gonna maybe win win a win any awards for its writing, but it's there's certainly nothing wrong with it. Let's move on to our next category, Liam, which will be animation and visuals. And I believe uh, is did I see that Dong Yang is responsible for this one? Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, the word that I would use to describe this episode is oh boy. <laughs> uh or or alternatively inconsistent yeah i think that's fair um that's that's about what i would uh would suggest as well um it's interesting because dong yang i mean has has been working with them obviously there's there's a lot of episodes that they that they had especially in the sort of original run the first 65 episodes they did but they obviously went on to work uh, in the new Batman adventures and Superman and all the way into JLU. Although I will mention that uh, everything post uh, Superman, I believe uh, was done in tandem with Coco, uh, which is one of the, one of the other uh, Japanese animation studios. And this is one of, so this uh, series is a little bit different in that regard that they were working, I guess, on their own. Um, and I know when, when Kevin Altieri was on, he mentioned that even, even when that specific animation studio's name is on there, sometimes they were also farming it out to other animations, you know, smaller animation studios to help with the workload. So yeah, hard to say that this is all a, a Dong Yang's fault for lack of a better word, but yeah, there's some really weird, uh, inconsistencies, especially. Actually, like it felt like head shapes were a big problem in this episode and head sizes. Yeah, there's there's a lot of perspective issues that I saw. It felt like characters faces uh, and and heads definitely changed a lot, though. The driver of the limo, the one the one that lackey of the penguins in the first in the first scene, uh, the way that he looks in that scene versus the way that he looks at the end of the episode even in that final scene, I feel like his head changes shape like four or five different times. Like mm -hmm. it's very strange. There's a lot of odd choices. Also, there's a scene where we get the penguin really up close. There's a lot of up close face shots in this one too. And again, that could have been <laughs> uh, because of the way that it was storyboarded or what have you, but a lot of up close face shots between Batman, the penguin. We get this one shot where he's going over these sort of bills of sale from this automobile parts company sort of putting things together and for like a split second he's got like bloodshot his one eye is bloodshot and then it goes away like you see the red veins in his eye and it's not depicting like anger or like he's losing it it's just he's talking and all of a sudden his one eye has these these blood red veins in it and then it goes away it was very strange <laughs> yes it was it was an odd choice, odd choice to leave in, an odd choice for just this half a second frame, and something that I don't think I ever seen again in in the DCAU or in in for the animation for any of these shows. Yeah, that is well, and I I can imagine the storyboard was maybe him with a because it's a like a, a close up that okay we want the one eye to be bloodshot, but to your point, it's not like even for the not, not much less like you know, multiple shots, not even that one shot. It's just like all of a sudden his one eye kind of grows bigger and we see all of the veins in it suddenly. So it's, it's not even consist consistent in the same shot, much less, you know, one, one to another. So yeah, that's pretty weird. Um, I do think, I think the highlights are a, a lot, what they maybe do well in this episode is the, all, a lot of the vehicle chase stuff. For sure. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff as far in that first chase sequence at the start of the episode. There's a there's a shot as the, the penguins limo is, is being chased by the Batmobile and they're going over a bridge and you sort of have this kind of further out sh uh, shot where they're kind of passing the cars are passing behind sort of the, you know, the different uh, girders and, and steel of the bridge and then sort of as it as it passes one of those girders and kind of becomes and be becomes obstructed 
when the, the vehicle comes out the other side, it's suddenly we're watching the Batmobile. It's like, it's, it's not a cut at all. It's just this very sudden shift where we were watching it. It, go, it kind of gets obstructed for a second. And then all of a sudden we're watching the Batmobile. I thought that was really cool. Uh, the final sequence where they're, where they're sort of being, you know, slammed around by the penguin as he's in control and they go, they're going up in the, uh, the parking garage. I thought it was very cool. And uh, the shot when, um, when they finally do eject and they realize sort of the secret code and, and jump out and first they just sort of fly up into the air on the ejector seats. And then the, the wings of the glider pop out behind them. They, they sort of become completely silhouetted. And then you have the, the bat wings against the the sky and the moon. That's always a great shot. And I thought that was a, that was pretty epic there. Um, but yeah, so there is some good stuff in here. I think a lot of the, the vehicle stuff stands out, but uh that's you know that has to contend with the uh the rough character models unfortunately yeah i i agree it's um there's a lot of there is some fun stuff uh first of all uh let's talk about percival the vulture shall we like (laughs) I, i don't know if this is the same vulture from i've got batman in my basement i don't remember him being named percival but maybe it is um, if not, it's another vulture that the penguin has Im- Im- managed to come into uh, possession of. So uh, we get this a vulture action there. I thought that was pretty awesome. Uh, but actually serious, there's uh, there's a scene, the scene where the penguin and his men break into the garage for the first time. They blow a, a hole in this wall and they sort of walk in and they pan over and it's just the silhouettes. I felt like there were several scenes, actually. It's funny you mentioned the silhouettes as they as they jump out of the, or they're ejected out of the, the Batmobile. It's, there's several scenes where silhouettes kind of work. There's, there's, uh, you know, right when, when, uh, when Earl comes up as Batman and Robin are picking up the Batmobile from, from his uh, garage, uh, there's a, there's a scene for just, it's just adding to the dramatic effect. He sort of just walks out of this silhouetted, uh, silhouetted scene and kind of out of the darkness. And you kind of see him walk towards the screen. Looks great, Earl. Big job, wasn't it? You look tired. Yeah, well, it took longer than I figured. See, I uh, haven't even had time to clean up yet. Where's Martha? Oh, down in the basement. Got some cleaning to do down there. In the basement. By the way, I even fixed the air conditioning switch. Uh, right. So there was several, I thought, uh, effective shadow work and silhouette work that they did uh, did use well for this. I think inside the Batmobile, as you touched on, uh, there's several shots of, of Batman and Robin inside of that kind of, you know, looking past some of the perspective issues. There are some where it feels like they're maybe a little bit too, the windows to, are on the side of them are a little bit too low than what they should be for where the Batmobile like closes, but you can look past that. But there's a couple of pan shots that go through the Batmobile kind of from looking right at them, sort of passing over to looking at Batman's side. And it's one continuous pan shot. I thought that that was pretty, pretty strong uh when the when the when the airbags go off uh there's you know there's a struggle with kind of trying to deflate the airbags that the two of them mm-hmm. have um and then we get uh what should be i i don't know if it's a if it is one of the more used batman gifts but uh a batman finger wag we get uh you know batman <laughs> stomping on after he stomps on the uh the 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 penguin umbrella gun there's a pan up to batman and he's standing there and we get the mm, 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 finger wag it just <laughs> doing the dikembe mutombo action that's right there. uh you know pretty pretty strong visual there so i i did enjoy that uh would also be remiss not to mention the fact that at the very end as the penguin is working on the the license plates for Gotham uh, it is mentioned or it is listed at the bottom of the of the Gotham license plate that it is the dark deco state which uh, if you're yes. an uber nerd fan dark deco uh, is uh, is a pretty important term that's right so yeah obviously art deco was is sort of the style of the architecture of the buildings and such uh, going back to that sort of classic 1930s and 40s style but uh, Dark Deco was sort of the 
the the term coined in the production of this series by uh, by the people that were working on it and, and Warner Brothers Animation to describe not only the architecture, but of course, as, as we've talked about numerous times, especially those earlier episodes were being uh, where the backgrounds were being drawn on black paper, uh, thus the term dark deco was sort of born as the uh, as the descriptive term of uh, of uh, how you would describe the visual style of the series. And yeah, that was a that was a fun little Easter egg to throw in there, which uh, you, I mean, you think about nowadays, we can we can look that up on Google. But yeah, think about how few people even got that in in 1993 when this aired. So yeah, that's a that's a fun little note. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, we apparently know that Gotham is a state. So Gotham City is inside of Gotham State, I guess. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so when we're asking when we're asking a friend of the show, Kevin Altieri, where the Statue of Liberty is in Gotham, it is in Gotham. It's in Gotham State. <laughs> uh, if you're interested in hearing that check out the the our uh, full episode with the director of this episode and the ep- episode off balance and a whole bunch of other episodes uh in the archives at dcaureview.com that was a fun one to discuss some of that stuff with him uh but yeah liam i, th- I think overall inconsistency and in so- sort of the character models uh some of the way that the art worked and knowing that this Art this studio typically does a, a fairly strong job. I haven't had as many complaints uh, f- with this one as we have as, as some of the other ones. So um, I was a little bit, you know, a little bit upset that there was there was some inconsistencies here, and it was a little bit distracting. I'd say in that final scene. Uh, so for all of those reasons, I ended up giving visuals uh, six out of 10, despite having some great, great pants and some great visual action there. It's it's hard, hard to to, you know, to to really <laughs> look at both of those things and say, eh, it's yeah, it, I, I can't ignore it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I actually went with the exact same score of six out of 10. Uh, like I said, there's some really cool stuff in the vehicle sections. Those the silhouette uh, shot. There's actually a, a another silhouette shot in the episode as uh, the penguin uh, and his crew burst into the uh, to the, uh, the auto shop uh, when they first confront Earl. It's penguin and his three goons and and they're all sort of uh, backlit by the light coming in from outside as they just blown up this wall and walked through and they're all sort of standing in silhouette. So there's definitely some cool stuff, some cool Batman stuff. We do get to see the uh, the original Batman costume briefly in those flashbacks, the the original pocket belt suit with, uh, with no oval around the bat and as well as the uh, what is a pretty clear homage to the the Dick Spring era Batmobile? So definitely some cool stuff, uh, but uh, yeah, the the inconsistency of again that's that's it's unfortunate. But as you mentioned, there's also a lot of close ups in this episode, so it's it's very noticeable. I think when uh, when people's heads and head sizes are changing and eye sizes and things like that. So yeah, not not terrible, but certainly not the best work from uh, from this animation studio or uh, or this uh, production team. Did you give your score? I didn't hear it. Yes, I gave it a six out of ten. Okay. Yeah, I, I also for the flashback scenes, one of the things that they consistently do in flashbacks is give it that black and white shading also, which is well appreciated. Uh, still angling for maybe the new Bruce Tim Batman series. We can get some episodes that are just done in black and white because uh, really appreciate that that grayscale color color uh, scheme. Sometimes it's uh, very effective, adds a lot of cool atmosphere to it. But uh, yeah. Six out of 10 for both of us uh, just kind of puts this middle of the road. All right, Liam, let's move on to our next category. That is going to be music, which uh, I was surprised to hear. It wasn't uh, it wasn't Miss Shirley Walker who is responsible for this week's uh, music, was it? Yes, that's right. So we have uh, we have two people uh, responsible. Uh, Peter Tomaszek, who I believe we've uh, spoken about a few times before in this animated series, uh, and he was joined by John Tagenhorst. Apologies if I'm butchering that last name, but uh, they both, uh, I guess, co-produced the music for this episode or co-conducted the orchestra. And uh, it's a, it's a pe- penguin episode, so we get what is one of, if not my favorite, villain theme, and. Uh, as we've talked about for for years now with with the batman theme and with these villain themes 
What's fun about it is that it's played in so many different ways. It's played very frantically when you have the uh, the chase sequence at the start of the episode, or even when you know when he sort of first appears in this underground sewer lair, um, and then when he's uh, threatening uh, the his henchmen and he's trying to figure out what what they're going to do, why this uh, this accountant has been brought to him, and then as the accountant's being uh, sent off to die down the uh, being sent down the drain, so to speak, we we hear it brought back in again, and it's it's brought in very sort of dramatically and sinisterly when he uh, when he confronts Earl. So uh, that's kind of my my big thing was this episode was how varied and and well used that penguin theme was. Yeah, it's it's definitely the theme for the episode. It plays all the way up uh, from the beginning of the episode as we get the reveal of the the limousine all the way up through the end uh, sort of as the limousine taunts the Batmobile and the penguin takes over the car and uh, so we get it played up all the way through the end and then the Batman theme sort of raising triumphantly as we get that the culmination with the license plates I thought was was pretty fitting as it's that ultimately is the triumph of the episode is we get the uh you know the foiled again sort of penguin reaction as he reacts to this this batman themed license plate uh being distributed to him so uh, <laughs> yeah i think overall it's it, the penguin theme is one of those themes and, and I'm, I'm sure we've talked about it on on past episodes it's one of those that's instantly recognizable you know it it ranks very highly on the list probably i dare say rivaling the joker theme uh, for the series and and you know maybe some of maybe the mad hatters theme or the or scarecrow's theme uh probably above those for sure so it, you know it's one of those it's instantly instantly hummable you know exactly who the villain's going to be based on the based on the cues from that from that uh, particular piece. So to have an episode that focuses solely on the Penguin being the main villain and have that be the, the thread that runs throughout it, I think led this to be a very strong uh, music, musically centered episode. Um, you know, I think that they, they, they punctuated the scenes the way that they needed to with that. I think the chase scenes also, uh, again, one of my favorite things to point out, the, you know, the chase scenes or the battle mobile riding through the through the parking garage up to the roof or as he's taken hold of it and sort of speeds away on the air, airport uh, tarmac uh the music creating the tension and you know oh my goodness they're going to slam into this brick wall and then at the last second the penguin veers it out of the way and then as they're sort of climbing the ramp to the top of this parking garage the music continues and it matches these fantastic visuals as they're spinning up this this ramp and uh then as he again launches them off the roof and you're waiting sort of just there with bated breath is how are how are batman and robin going to get out of this batmobile and then finally he hits the air conditioning button and the you know the the ejectors kick in uh it just i think this is a very very strong episode when it comes to music i thought that they the composers did quite a great job at using the familiar music but also you know creating this new theme and these new uh these new pieces to sort of accentuate for all those reasons, I gave music a very strong nine out of 10. What about you? Yeah, I'm just a tick lower. I went eight out of 10, but yeah, I think, uh, I, I think we're pretty much in agreement here as far as our, uh, as far of what we, uh, we liked about it. Yeah. I think that's, that is the hallmark of, of the music is how well it, it accompanies each scene and, uh, you know how how it adds to that drama in those, in those moments. And even the, the Batman theme being brought in as a, as we mentioned, when the when they sort of when the glider when the bat wings pop out of the gliders and they're in, they're sort of in silhouette and the Batman theme kicks in and then kicks back in again as Batman is sort of confronting Penguin at the end. They're all, always uh, good to see the the creative ways to bring that theme as well and sort of the way in that final scene that that and the Penguin theme are sort of bleeding in in and out of each other. So I, I, I always appreciate that that mixture when we see that. So. A very good showing this week. That's right. All right, man. Let's move on to our last category, which will be our voice actors. So, a uh, relatively uh, medium-sized cast. Certainly, some returning vocal performances that we're bound to recognize based on the names and previous appearances in this series, uh, and a, a very important special guest as well for uh, our our main ally of the Dark Knight here. So, let's talk about uh, today's voice actors. 
That's right. So yeah, we have a uh, Candy Brown playing Marva. Folks might know from the uh, Jamie Fox Muhammad Ali movie. Um, a lot of these actors, I'm just kind of hit hit real quick because they didn't do a lot in the episode, but some of them are uh, do have notable other acting roles that you would recognize them from. Uh, Walter Olkowicz, as uh, who's playing Falcone in this episode, was uh, would be uh, known to people who are big fans of the Twin Peaks series. Um, we have uh, we have Barry Gordon as one of the other uh, Penguin uh, minions. Shell Drake, uh, who folks would know as the voice of Donatello on the '80s Ninja Turtles cartoon. Oh, there you go. Uh, very classic veteran voice actor. There we have a. Uh, John Delancey as Eagleton, um, another uh, sort of veteran character actor there. And, uh, and then we have uh, Steve Franken as uh, Rundle, the, uh, the, uh, the sort of the, the accountant or lawyer, whatever he is, that uh, discovers the, the Batmobile uh, has parts ordered for it. Uh, who's, uh, I enjoy that because he's just this weird, wormy little guy. <laughs> and then <laughs> is so immediately like, in over his head with uh with the penguin and with the other thugs there i I really like that sequence a lot and i liked his back and forth with the penguin where he's he's sort of taken aback as to the fact that the penguin's going to pay him for this information (laughs) and and the penguin treats it as if he's negotiating with him (laughs) just so great just a good back and forth between the two of them and a funny a funny comedic bit that wasn't necessary but they both both uh both voice actors both mr williams and he played it uh, played off really well absolutely and yeah that will uh will bring us to our, our last two guest actors of the peach we of course have paul williams as the penguin i don't feel like he gets he has a fair amount of dialogue but i don't feel like he has a ton to do anyway other than that sequence with rundle which i do think is very good um he kind of gets some some sort of signature for lack of a better term uh penguin uh, a lot of penguins dialogue feels very very like pun pun laden for sure in a a way that uh yeah yeah in a way that and not just bird related ones either he's uh you know talking about how we'll let the you know let the air out of your sails as he's setting off the airbags and stuff like (laughs) that so he's he's uh, he's an all an all all points pun guy um but so i don't i don't feel like he gets a ton to do but he's you know he's obviously very good in the role and is is sufficiently sinister and evil for the uh the point the purposes of this episode Hmm. He set you up here, huh? Well, now you're going to set him up. Now be sure to do exactly as I tell you, or the next person who gets a jolt out of your security device will be your charming daughter. And uh, and then we have Mr. Paul Winfield as uh, as Earl, who folks might know from Star Trek or the Terminator movies, as, uh, as well as being the voice of uh, Barbara Gordon's husband, Sam, on Batman Beyond, uh, playing Earl. And it's interesting because his, his performance, I'm kind of thinking, well, it's kind of one note. Like, there's not a lot of great uh, you know, changes to his inflection, whether it's sad or, or angry. But I do really like him in, that, in the flashback sequence when he's talking to the boss and then in, in kind of some of that that brief dialogue that he has with Batman towards the end when he's trying to warn them and he's being like uh, deliberately weird about it. And mm-hmm. uh, I think that sequence there is fun when he's when he's trying to sort of let them in on the secret and and uh, Batman and uh, and Robin aren't quite getting it there. So I, I think he does a pretty solid job, if, if not a spectacular one. Yeah, I think there's a there was two two points that stood out to me. One was definitely in his narration. He carries that almost that full second act there because it's so mm-hmm. heavy on his dialogue explaining exactly how he came to know Batman and how he became to, you know, how he came to work on the Batmobile. So we get a whole dialogue, a whole monologue from him uh, sort of explaining the ins and outs of their relationship and the line that he delivers where he said and once again he saved my life again. Just yeah. I thought just the way that he delivered that and then them kind of ending the dialogue to sort of having you know batman stepping up and saying i need a new car just really really good i was down to my last dime no money no job and no prospects for one and then he saved my life again Uh i need a new car it was a challenge of a lifetime. 
It took me six months to come up with the design specs alone. Titanium construction, ablative skin cowling, trinitro propulsion units. He paid for everything, cash. Found this site for a garage, too, and outfitted it to my specifications and paid me real well. But he got his money's worth. Um, and that that I think coupled with his excitement in explaining what he's going to do to upgrade the Batmobile in that very last scene with with him and Batman and Robin talking about the various different parts and upgrades. It came off legitimately like he was this this car nerd that was super excited about getting these, you know, getting these parts and he's going to do these upgrades and you know, how he's going to how he's going to make the Batmobile even better. So I really, really enjoyed that I, I think that uh, initially I was a little bit like, oh man, this this is not. I didn't think for the first opening scene. I think the one note was sort of like, ah, I don't know how this performance is going to go. But I think it also plays into the character, just kind of being this unfappable good hearted, good person um, that kind of had to keep, keep his cool in the midst of everything, especially with the penguin kind of you know, taking his daughter hostage and sort of remaining uh, cool under pressure. And that, and that makes sense for the character to me, because I think it would be something that attracted uh, Batman to him, knowing that he's somebody that he can trust, knowing that the power that comes with this, you know, creating this vehicle and what, what he could do knowing that this guy is sort of this unfappable, just good hearted, good human being uh, lends lends to that. And I think the performance uh, speaks of that. Agreed. And uh, I enjoy his interactions with uh, the aforementioned heroes of the piece. We of course have Lauren Lester returning as Robin. Um, doesn't talk very much in the episode, but uh, and actually Batman and Robin really aren't in the episode all that much is uh, after that first sequence they're they're gone for most of it save for the uh, batman's brief appearance in the in the flashback sequence but they don't really return until the uh, that third act starts there but uh, yeah i think there's some good stuff with uh, with lauren lester and of course with uh, kevin conroy's batman um mostly i think when they're like i said that that interaction they have with uh with earl in the in the garage before they drive off and then sort of that as they sort of start to realize what's happening and, and they're sort of starting, there's, there's kind of panic more so in Robins, but I think you can even feel Batman feels very out of control of the situation there. So it's, it's kind of an, uh, it's not necessarily fear you're hearing in either of their voices, but you can tell they're sort of getting worked up as they're realizing they're really not in control and that this might, this looks like it could be a death trap that even they can't figure a way out of. Yeah, I think between the two of them and and Batman sort of, I think the one scene where he has to sort of put the uh, puzzle pieces together as they're driving, figuring out what Earl was specifically referencing. I think Kevin Conroy at his finest, you get sleuth Batman, you get detective Batman in that in that moment. They're just trying to put the pieces together and figure out. Uh, just what he was saying. And I, Lauren Lester's performance, he, he was not required to do a whole lot. I appreciated that they didn't write a whole bunch of needless quips for him in this episode. So that was a positive. <laughs> I did cackle a little bit. It matched with the visuals, actually. So as Batman is is driving alongside the, the, the limousine and as the Penguin takes over, obviously Robin uh, would have no idea what's happening, but there's l- this look of disgust on, that they drew on Robin's face as bat as the Batmobile is just slamming up against the guardrail, <laughs> and then they follow that up by giving Robin the line, "What are you doing?" And he's just so <laughs> just so incredulously asking Batman, like, "Why are you driving like this? What's wrong with you?" <laughs> Like, and obviously in the situation, it makes sense because why, why would Batman be driving the car into the, it would be, you would be incredulous. You would be asking these questions. So I, I think that was the highlight for me for Lauren Lester. Also the fact that he wasn't sort of sandbagged with a whole bunch of needless quipping, I think was also a, a plus as far as the writing is concerned, but yeah, they're, they're not asked to do a whole, mu- a whole lot other than sort of the reaction at the end. Once they realize that the, the Batmobile has been sabotaged, that's where we get the sort of the heavy lifting between the two of them uh and i i think it's it's great it's it's classic batman and robin i i I think both both of those guys together uh tend tend to be pretty darn good i'd say 
yeah i agree i think there's there's definitely some some fun stuff to be had there and and uh even if it isn't a spectacular episode for everybody there's still some fun there and uh that's why i actually settled on a seven out of ten for my voice acting nice i went just a tick higher i went eight out of ten for my voice acting all right, Liam. Uh, so let's wrap things up here and uh, get our final scores for this week's episode, totaling everything up, despite uh, some of my issues with the artwork and uh, and and maybe the plot not being as strong as I initially thought it might be for this episode, which, by the way, a lot of these episodes that don't necessarily have Batman in them a lot tend to be some of our favorites. So uh, mm-hmm. I was curious to see if that would that would sort of follow suit. Not not quite, maybe. Uh, for this episode based on uh, how we scored it but still ended up giving it a pretty strong 30 out of 40 what about you yeah i'm uh, i'm a few points lower uh not enough for the disagreement alarm i don't think but uh, i'm at 27 out of 40 for my final score so uh yeah i think it's a it's a good solid watch and uh, as as we kind of get into rewatchability here i don't think this one is particularly consequential to the series in any way um, other than a little bit of backstory of how Batman, uh, you know, gets how the sausage is made, so to speak, with Batman, some of Batman's uh, stuff. But uh, so I wouldn't say this is in any way must watch either as like a great episode of the series or as a, you know, something that's important to the to the timeline or to the, the continuity of the series. But I, you know, I have I have trouble saying this is a complete skip either. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it's a skip because I think it does add something to the to the Batman character, as I mentioned. It gives you a little bit of background on him. It's it doesn't drag. It's not too childish. It's not, you know, it's some good penguin fun, you know. So I I guess this is a I don't wouldn't say even though this is a one thumb up, maybe a half a thumb up. Is that is that a score? Can we give it that like a half thumb up for recommendation? It's not it (laughs) it doesn't it doesn't play like Earl doesn't come back. We don't ever hear his name mentioned again, not even in a throwaway line in another episode. So, you know, this character, for all intents and purposes, no longer exists after this episode. So it's really not that important. But it does give you a little bit of fun Batman flashbacks and you get some fun action with the Batmobile and vroom vroom and car chase and explosions and all that. So <laughs> if you're a fan of the fast and the furious movies, this episode is for you. That's right. Uh, there's, there's even some family. I know that's an important part of those <laughs> movies. I've never seen one, but if the memes people post on Twitter, when a new one comes out or any indication, family is a word and a theme that is often repeated. So we have a, a family and the father and daughter who, uh, who work on the bad mobile. So there you go. But that's the, uh, best, yeah. that's the best endorsement we could give you. If you're a fan <laughs> of the fast franchise, watch this episode. <laughs> that's right. All right, Liam. Well, that will begin to wrap us up for this week. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Don't forget, you can support us in a couple different ways. One of them is by subscribing to our podcast on your favorite podcast app, Apple, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, uh, pretty much any of the other podcast apps out there, you'll be able to find us. Uh, you can actually support the podcast directly. If you uh, if you appreciate what we do here, uh, we, we invest time in this. If you want to support us directly, Anchor actually puts a nice little link at the bottom of the episodes uh, on your podcast app that you can click. If you feel like you want to throw a couple bucks our, our way, we would appreciate it and uh we would greatly thank you for that and uh but we know understand in this economy are you kidding me in this economy uh yeah that that's not not very likely so maybe you want something some bang for your buck well check out the dcau review shop if you go to dcaureview.com click on the store page you can pick yourself up a shirt a hat a mug maybe a sticker uh get something for your buck and that'll that supports us also and if you're still looking for free ways to support us we get Get it in this economy? Are you kidding me? Did I say that enough? Uh, yeah, <laughs> go over to the Pod Tower YouTube page and and subscribe to us on there. That's a free way to uh, to to support us. You can also uh, like our videos each week that we post on there. That'll help. You know, comment on them, feed the algorithm, all that fun stuff. Um, and then follow us on uh, on social media at DCAU Review on Twitter and also on 
on uh, Instagram as well. Liam, uh, we are continuing next week uh, with more Batman the Animated Series. Uh, so that means we are going to continue in the order as as listed on the Blu-rays or DVDs, depending on or Maybe you have videotapes. I don't know. Whatever you got. Uh, so what is the next episode that we'll be covering? Yeah, if you fire up your laser disc and uh, get it, get like. <laughs> Go ahead and get this episode watched. Uh, Yeah, this one next week is a big, big, big one. That is the episode Harley and Ivy. So much, including entire animated series uh, made by other people in the future, uh, spawned from this episode. A million comics and lots of, uh, I believe you could call it shipping. So lots to talk about with that episode next week. Another uh, Paul Beanie Pen classic in harley and ivy coming up next week looking forward to it it should be another blast but until then i'm cal and i'm liam we'll talk to you on the next episode of the dcau review adios